Call council to order at 6.01 p.m. Uh, first of all, I need an adoption for the um, a motion for the adoption of minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Knox and seconded by Councillor Buds. All those in favor? And that's carried. We have a delegation this evening from Landmark Planning and Design, and this is on two Manitoba infrastructure projects. I'll turn the floor over to Landmark Planning. Mr. Taves, can you hear us? I can hear you just fine, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Taves, can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, Mr. Taves, please go ahead on your presentation. Great, thank you very much. Um, I've got two presentations. The first one is respecting the PTH1, PTH1A overpass, um, just, just west of Portage. And the second one is concerning the uh, proposed roundabout at PTH1 and PTH16. So I've got, I understand I've got 15 minutes. So I'll spend just about five or six minutes on each project and leave some time for questions if council should have any. Um, so the first, the first project, and again, uh, just to confirm everybody has that, the two presentations in front of them, if I reference certain slides, Nathan? That's correct. Great, thank you. So uh, in terms of the PTH1 1A overpass, um, it's, we're, we're just entering into the, uh, you know, the third round, as it were. If you want to flip over to slide three, project background. Uh, previous work was undertaken, some of you may recall, by WSP, and they had identified a number of redesign options. They'd gone through an evaluation process, and uh, since that time, uh, MI has selected a preferred option. Just when the WSP was heading out for their third round to, uh, to talk to folks out uh, and about about the uh, project and COVID hit. And I understand both the RM Council and City Council received presentations, but that was, uh, that was all who had heard about it. So it looks like we're uh, out about and again, and it's now Dylan and, and our company Landmark working on the project to finish off this stage of design. Um, one of the big parts, uh, big important parts of this, making this project successful is, is having a successful detour which I'll talk about in subsequent slides. And it's actually, we need a detour in order to construct the detour, so it's a little bit complex. Slide four, um, everyone I presume will be familiar with the location just west of town. It's shown on slide four. Slide five is the preferred reconstruction plan. And again, uh, council will have seen this for those of you who were there at that point, and perhaps you've had time to look at it this weekend, so I won't go into detail about it. But you can see on the plan, there are uh, access ramps as a usual intersection interchange would have, but they're also introduced the, this roundabout concept, which isn't a new concept by any stretch, but it is a, a new in a relatively new in Manitoba. So those two roundabouts, the one on the right, which would be your northbound uh, or westbound, depending how you look at it, as you're entering into or exiting off of the highway and entering into Portage from the, from the west end, a uh, roundabout would be at that location. That roundabout is uh, to be constructed first, and it will serve as the detour around the entire structure um, uh, during the construction period. And that detour is shown on slide six. So you see the purple and red lines come right through that roundabout and move everyone around the project site so the overpass can be, be constructed. In order to construct that piece, I mentioned the second detour that's shown it looks a bit complicated on slide seven and slide eight. Um, I won't again go into those into great detail, but we do need uh, for a very short period, six to eight weeks, a, uh, a detour uh, that would take folks off of uh, number one highway. And if they are wanting to get into, uh, into town from the west end, then they need to come off and um, use Can Oak, uh, part of which is uh, MI controlled and part of which is the, uh, the arm uh, portage controlled. So uh, they've worked out an arrangement uh, for the use of Cano Road that everybody's satisfied with. And again, that would be a short period of time in order to construct that long-term long -term detour to the, uh, to the east of the uh, interchange area. Um, slide nine, 
talk about stakeholder engagement, which I mentioned. We will be heading out to uh, share this presentation with uh, your constituents and, and others in the area. Those, those folks are all listed on slide uh, 10. Uh, you can see the, the final bullet on this list says others as identified. So if we have missed a group um, that any, anyone on council has any suggestions for us, we're happy to take those and happy to, to include them. But it's a fairly lengthy list. We want to make sure the lines of communication are open and so that everyone's aware of what's going on and, uh, and not surprised to the best of our ability. We'll make sure that doesn't happen. Um, slide 11 talks a little bit about timing in terms of that engagement plan. Uh, we are at that big red arrow, sharing plans with yourself, uh, Council, and then uh, tomorrow we'll have a meeting with CRM as well. We did have a, a previous meeting with CRM to talk about that uh, detour for the detour a week or two ago. Go ahead into stakeholder meetings, and we will hold a public open house uh, probably virtually given the state of things still and uh, plan that for May and then we'll, we'll carry on with communication throughout the life of the project. Our next steps are to review feedback provided after all of our engagement sessions. Uh, keep those lines of communication open, respond to questions, uh, re refine and finalize the, this option. Uh, there's a lot of design to be done in the next little while and the detour plan to be finalized. And then that'll set, uh, set the team up for uh, going for tendering for construction. And then all of this plan, we're, we're into construction. So that's it for the first one, Nathan. I thought it might be best to stop for some questions here before going on to the next presentation. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Uh, questions from members of council? Councillor Walt? Uh, one question that people I talk to all the time <coughs> is uh, when would construction start? If the question was when would construction start, Nathan? Correct. Um, like, likely in spring, um, but I just before this call, I, I asked for a, an up-to-date schedule because that, those things tend to evolve, and I will confirm that answer by email to Nathan tomorrow. And the second most frequently que asked question is when would construction be complete? Was, was that the same question, Nathan? Uh, the question was, uh, when would the construction be complete, potentially? How long oh, is the term oh, of the project? I, I hear you. Um, typically about uh, two years' time. But again, uh, I, on the timing question, I'd like to confirm that, and I'll give it to you in, in, uh, in writing as well. Okay. Other uh, questions? Another question here. Just the uh, new all-directional access, which is currently... Uh, gravel service road on the south side of the interchange. Um, and I know that there's gonna be some work done to increase the roadway width underneath the current bridge. Is that roadway being resurfaced? Is it gonna remain gravel or will that be paved at the end of the project? I believe it will be gra remain gravel, um, although Can Oat Road is planned to be uh, upgraded to asphalt. Other questions from council? One of the uh, one of the questions that's been asked was um, space for location of a city of Portage sign, a welcome to Portage sign in, in that area. Can you comment yeah. on that? Yeah, actually that's good. Uh, today, because of the limited time, we decided just to focus on uh, the big picture. But we, we do expect to come back to council and we would appreciate uh, council's input on this question. Uh, Glenn Manning from Hilton and Thomas Frank Cram, HTSC, is our landscape architect, and he's tasked with designing a, a welcome to Portage uh, sign or some kind of monument or whatever the case may be. And uh, as part of his work, he, he plans to speak with council to gain your input both on, uh, uh, you know, appearance or form, um, not that we would ask you to design it, of course, but just the notion and also location. So uh, Glenn, is, Glenn plans to come to council at your next council meeting to talk in more detail about that. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any further questions of council on the first project? Okay, we're good to move into the second. Great, thank you. This one, um, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at it over the weekend, but it's some 60 odd slides. Um, but, of course, we won't be going through the 60 slides today. There's a lot of 
quite interesting information and some links and videos and so on and so forth. But I, hey, can you still hear me okay, Nathan? We can. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just, uh, I'm going to move through about six or seven of the slides and, uh, and just provide some high level insight. And then I'll, again, I'll turn it over to questions. <clears throat> so slide four deals with so the reason um, that Manitoba Infrastructure is examining intersection improvements. They've settled on the idea of a roundabout. There's a, a high level or an elevated level of incident collisions at the intersection, not that they're uh, over, over the roof, but uh, it is an issue. Um, and they are not considering an interchange option in the short term. So in the shorter term, they've decided that uh, a roundabout would be a worthy exploration. And this presentation and the materials, uh, which you can look at it at your leisure, explain how a roundabout would work. Um, slide seven talks a little bit about timing. Again, that big red arrow there, quite a bit further along in this project, uh, February to May of 2021, where the red arrow is, selecting communicate a roundabout option. That's, that's what we're doing here and uh, with other, other folks in the vicinity. The timing for this one, it says spring, summer 2021. There's a, a slight scope change to the design dealing with the rail, which I'll touch on later. That means uh, probably we wouldn't see construction until next spring if it's to go in the end in terms of timing. Slide 15, if you want to zip ahead, is uh, just talking about safety. There's quite a few slides about safety, but I just chose this one simply to say uh, roundabouts are tested worldwide and very clearly demonstrate in every case uh, very substantial reductions in, in harm. Uh, so they're safer. The reason they're safer is they reduce speed uh, dramatically. So you, you still get accidents. Still get incidents, of course, um, drivers being uh, being drivers, uh, but the severity is drastically reduced. Um, for the most part, it eliminates fatal collisions, and so you get minor collisions as you would in any intersection, but uh, it reduces uh, fatalities very dramatically. Slide 21 shows the actual, um, you know, at a concept level, uh, the roundabout and the location of the roundabout just west of the Petrocan station at PTH 16. You can kind of, one of the noteworthy things about roundabouts or things you can spot is how the roads curve as they, you come into them. It's designed to do that to purposely slow drivers down. Um, there's, there's great compliance with uh, folks. It's just a natural tendency to, to put your foot over the brake and slow down as you get into the roundabout and navigate through it. So that one shows shows the location, uh, as I mentioned. There's a bunch of videos I would encourage, uh, if you haven't already uh, done so in the subsequent slides, to, to watch. They show larger vehicles. Uh, often that's one of the big concerns is, you know, will large vehicles be able to get through there? Short answer is they are or they will. And there's uh, slides 25 through 45. There's about 20 slides there that show the due diligence of the engineers in uh, trying pretty much every kind of vehicle, largest uh, the smallest ones are not the issue. The large ones uh, go through there. So they've shown all those in, uh, in slides 25 to 45. And the, <clears throat> the lines you're seeing, the red lines, are what's called the uh, swept path. It's different than the wheel path. So the, the, the way that big vehicles move through these roundabouts is the cab stays in the lane, and then the, uh, the trailer parts are designed to, if they need to, to ride the apron, uh, which is that section sort of in the middle. Um, slides 46 to 51 deal with a really important question that had to do with the rail uh, rail crossing to the north, the CN rail at PTH 16. Uh, lots of concern that, you know, busy weekend for Country Fest when we get it back, that, uh, more, you know, occasionally on those, those periods, would there be a problem with the traffic back up and, and make the roundabout not functional? And so those slides deal with that question, and they, uh, with the design changes, it, it works. And uh, there's some slides that show uh, statistics, but also the, uh, the lineups and some actual scenarios of <clears throat> backing up. And so the, the short answer is they've created a lot of storage. They're uh, proposing to add a lane on uh, PTH 16 that would uh, make it two lanes even crossing the CN rail, which 
which was the design change I referred to earlier. So that, that's why it would take a little longer when you're working with the rail, that it takes a little longer. But uh, long and short of it is there's lots of storage going to be available so that uh, a lineup won't bung up the uh, roundabout. 554 to 59, um, lots of folks are anxious at times, something new in your area, but we also want to show that it's not a new technology, it's not uh, new in the country, and we have drivers, of course, who, who do cross uh, across the country and see these things all over. So we, we put together a slate of examples, and we've got them you know, south and north, cold areas, hot areas, uh, <clears throat> small highways and, and large highways. So lots of great um, examples so that we're not out on a limb. We, we did have some uh, conversations with Alberta to talk about some of their highway roundabouts and how they're working in you'll see some feedback in, uh, in those slides as well. And then at the end, we included some uh, roundabout educational materials and some really great videos that come out of uh, Alberta just to explain to people because a, a big part of implementing something new is educating drivers. It's, um, you know, people come to something relatively new and they may not be sure what to do. And there's lots that you can do uh, to help address that, that issue. So that's uh, the best I can do. And, five or six minutes uh, for, for such a substantial topic, but I will open it up for questions again, Nathan. Okay, thank you. Um, council, uh, questions? Uh, just to be clear, so would, right now, do you think the construction of both the roundabout and the overpass be taking place at the same time? Is that a likelihood? Uh, yes, that is a likelihood. And it's, you know, and there's some advantages to that. Um, you know, people are entering a construction zone and, you know, likely be a construction zone from uh, the, the uh, overpass at the south end, see an overpass at the south end all the way to, uh, you know, to, towards the west past the roundabout. So uh, people be on uh, caution throughout the area. Okay. Any uh, further questions from council? Well, I want to thank you very much for your presentation this evening, and uh, we look forward to hearing more details. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, you're most welcome. And thanks for accommodating me on the phone. The highway's got a little crazy today, so I hope, uh, hope this worked out okay. Yeah, it, it seemed to work out well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your council meeting. Thank you. Okay, hey, we're going to move into public hearings. Um, we'll open the public hearing for variation PC 1221. This is for Melco Development Limited, 33, 35, 71, 73, 75, 77, 79, 81, 83, 85, 91, and 93 Melco Drive. Is there anyone here to speak to the hearing? Entertain a motion to close the hearing, please. Be it resolved, and I so move that the public hearing for variation PC 1221 for Melco Development Limited, 33, 35, 71, 73, 75, 77, 79, 81, 83, 85, 91, and 93 Melco Drive now be closed. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. Okay. In front of you, Council, from the Planning and Economic Development Committee, uh, referring to file number PC1221, request for variation. So the issue is to vary the front yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 6 meters to allow for larger rear yards. Uh, the background, of course, Melco Development's been applying for the variation to allow the front yard requirement to be reduced. This would actually be, would like to keep the area consistent with other developments within the area. There is a sketch there for your reference. And the applicants have applied for and received variations for similar requests. And the file numbers and the minute references are there for your information as well. The building is in an R1 residential single family zone. The application has been circulated to various city departments. There have been no concerns. Public notices have been sent to all property owners within a 100 meter radius, and there's been no objections. So it's an administrative recommendation, and I so move that the Council of the City of Portage La Prairie approve 
variation request of Melco Development Limited to vary the front yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 6 meters to allow for larger rear yards at the properties known as 33, 35, 71, 73, 75, 77, 79, 81, 83, 85, 91, and 93 Melco Drive, which is legally described as lots 30 to 31, lots 1 to 2, and lots 5 to 12, block 1, time 53601 in the parish of Portage La Prairie. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. Any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. We'll open the public hearing for variation PC 1321. This is for Clamoa at 1750 4th Avenue Northeast. Is there anyone here to speak to the hearing? And your name for the record, sir? Jamie Clamola. Thank you. Council, did you have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. There's one more thing. There's, uh, I'd like to have an eight foot fence instead of a six foot. Okay. okay. And that's the only, um, Councilor Meyer? So, your, your worship, so just to clarify, um, Mr. Klimola, what you're asking for is the, first of all, a towing service for the vehicle compound, but then secondly, the front yard fence height to be, can somebody please exchange eight feet to meters for me? Um, two point four meters. So what you're saying is front yard fence height to be 2.4 meters? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, any further questions for council? Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome to stay. Jamie. Okay, need a motion to close the hearing, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, be it resolved and I so move that the public hearing for variation PC 1321 Climola for 1754 4th Avenue Northeast now be closed. Moved by Councillor Myers, second by Councillor Buds. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. Okay, Council in front of you. As soon as I can open this up here, we have a request for variation for file number PC 1321. There is two sketches there for your information. One refers to where the fence is going to be and one refers to the property address. So the issue is to vary the following, a towing service with a vehicle compound and a front yard fence height to be 2.4 meters in height. So the background is Portage Towing Company. Jamie Climola is applying for a variation order to allow for the following. As I just mentioned, a towing service with a vehicle compound and a front yard fence height to be 2.4 meters high. Applicant would like to operate a towing service out of this location, but requires a fenced compound with a 2.4 meter high fence for security reasons. Fence needs to be around completed compound area. In the past, City Council has approved similar requests. You'll see the file numbers and the minute references there for your information. The building is in an M2 heavy industrial zone. The application has been circulated to various city departments. There have been no concerns. And public notices have been sent to all property owners within a 100 meter radius and there's been no objections. So it's the recommendation of this committee and I so move that the Council of the City of Portage or Prairie approve the variation request of Portage Towing Care of Jamie Climola to vary the following. A towing service with a vehicle compound and B, front yard fence height to be 2.4 meters high at the property known as 1754th Avenue Northeast, which is legally described as Lot 3, Plan 24045 in the parish of Portage La Prairie. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. 
Any questions or comments on the motion? Councilor Butts? Yeah, just quickly, since the public notices have all gone out with the the height of the fence being two meters, is there any requirement for further notification knowing that it's going up higher? Guido, would you like to comment on that? Yes, through your worship to Councillor Buds, that we discussed this with the planning district and we feel that the difference in industrial zone isn't a su substantial enough change that uh, ultimately council can approve whatever they want in these hearings, of course, and we believe that that is not a substantial enough change to cause concern. Thank you. Any further questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. We'll open the public hearing for variation PC 1421, City of Port of Prairie, and this is for 10 5th Street Southeast. Is there anyone here to speak to the hearing? Any questions? Okay. Carly Friesen will answer any questions council may have. Are there any questions for her? Need a motion to close the public hearing? Be it resolved and I so move that the public hearing for variation PC 1421 for the city of Portage La Prairie on 10 5th Street Southeast now be closed. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. Okay. Council in front of you uh, from the Planning and Econo Economic Development Committee, file number PC1421, a request for variation for the City of Portage La Prairie. So the issue is to vary the following, which is a front yard requirement of 15.2 meters to be reduced down to 2.3 meters, and the rear yard requirement of 3 meters to be reduced to 2.2 .2 meters, and south side yard requirement of 1.5 meters to be reduced to 0.9 meters. So there's a couple of sketches that show you exactly the location uh, on that street. This is right on the corner of Saskatchewan Avenue. And the background is that the city of Portage La Prairie is applying for variation order to allow the following, as I previously mentioned. City wishes to install a standby generator on the city lift station site. And of course it is a permitted use, but site re requirements are still to be met. Since the property is small, site requirements cannot be met, so that's why a variance is required. This building is in an OR, or an open space recreational zone. The application has been circulated to various city departments. There's been no concerns, and public notices have been sent to all property owners within a 100 meter radius, and there's been no objections. So, it's the administrative recommendation, and I so move that the Council of the City of Portage La Prairie approve the variation request of City of Portage La Prairie to vary the following. Front yard requirement of 15.2 meters to be reduced to 2.3 meters. Rear yard requirement of 3 meters to be reduced to 2 meters. And south side yard requirement of 1.5 meters to be reduced to 0.9 meters. At the property known as 10 5th Street Southeast, which is legally described as Lot 1, Plan 34698 in the parish of Portage La Prairie. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. Any uh, questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Knox? Just a comment that I'm happy to support this for a generator at the lift station considering it was a morning with a storm and no power, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any further comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. We open the uh, public hearing for variation PC 1621. This is for Rob at 429 10th Street Northwest. Is there anyone here to speak to the hearing? Could you state your full name for the record, sir? Steve Rowe. Thank you. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Just answer questions. Yes. Were there any questions from council? No, nope. seeing none. Thank you, sir. Need a motion to close the hearing. Be it resolved and I so move that the public hearing for variation PC 1621, Rob for 429 10th Street Northwest now be closed. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. 
Okay, Council from the Portage or the Planning and Economic Development Committee, file number PC 1621 is a request for variation. The applicant would like to vary the front yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced down to 2.6 meters. A bit of the background. Oh, and first of all, there are a couple of sketches there for your information. Oops, they won't load for me, but they are there. Uh, Keith and Shelley Robb are applying for variation in order to allow the front yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 2.6 meters. They're wanting to construct a larger deck, 1.82 meters by 3.2 meters. A review of the area did find that 10 houses on the west side of the street, four of them are at least back from the front property line that required 7.5 meters. Two of the houses are 5.79 meters and 6.4 meters respectively, while the remaining four are 4.5 meters back. The four that are the 4.57 meters are all beside each other. So of the 10 houses on the east side of the street, seven of them are back from the front property line that required the 7.5 meters. One is six meters back, which is a mobile home. Another one is three meters back, which is a mobile home, and there are two empty lots. The applicant's house is one of the houses that is already back 4.57 meters from the property line. In the past, council has approved a similar requests. The file numbers were there and the minute references for your information. The building is in a R1, a residential single family zone. The application has been circulated to various city departments. There have been no concerns. Public notices have been sent to all property owners with a 100 meter radius, and as you can see, there's been no objections. So it's the administrative recommendation, and I so move, that the Council of the City of Porters of Prairie approve the variation request of Keith and Shelley Robb to vary the front yard requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 2.6 meters at the property known as 429 10th Street Northwest, which is legally described as lots 462, 463, Plan 13 of the Parish of Porters of Prairie. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. Any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. Okay, that's it for public hearings. We'll move right into committees. First up is Finance, Legislative and Property Committee. Councillor Buds, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Your committee has nothing to report. Uh, item in new business, but that's it. Thank you. Uh, city Planning and Economic Development. Councillor Meyer, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Other than a couple of items in new business, the City Planning and Economic Development Committee has nothing else to report. Okay. Community Services Committee. Councillor Draycott, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Nothing for Community Services Committee at this moment. Thank you. And Waterworks Committee. Councillor Wall. Thank you, Your Worship. Nothing to report at this time. Thank you. Transportation Committee. Councillor Espy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Your Worship. The Transportation Committee has nothing to report. Thank you. And Councillor Knox, Public Safety Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. Nothing from your Public Safety Committee this evening. Thank you. We have no deferred business this evening. However, we have a number of items of new business. First up is the 2020 financial results, and this is Finance, Legislative, and Property Committee. Councillor Buds, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the item for Council's consideration here tonight is to review and approve the 2020 financial statements. These are pre audited statements. And these are the statements that management has prepared for our year end. Mm -hmm. And so just some analysis here. Um, we always do this. We complete them in advance of our external audit. The uh, external auditors are expected to complete their field work in April and provide the audited financial statements for city council approval in June. Very good news. The general and utility funds both have year end surpluses, slightly over 2.2 million for the general fund and 2.5 million for the utility fund. And although this will be subject to year-end order adjustments, we still feel that these are going to come in at uh, significant surplus positions for both the utility and the general. I won't go through them all, but the, any variance exceeding $50,000 or greater by division uh, is provided in Appendix A. So when we have these types of surpluses in our budgeting process, we did a uh, lot or, or we're waiting for expecting some degree of surplus, obviously not this much but we have already made uh, some idea here in terms of the provision of where those surpluses would be allocated and $200,000 for our general police reserve. And this is again from the general fund side, 796,500 to the Crescent Lake Causeway project and the balance of 1.23 million to be allocated to our Saskatchewan Avenue West project. So this will reduce our further borrowing for this project. So really good news on several major infrastructure projects here where we're using surpluses and directing it right back 
into continuing to uh, build a better portage, and we've talked a lot about that in budgets. For the utility fund, 2020 surpluses will be allocated as follows, 700000 to the utility infrastructure reserve for water treatment and wastewater plant upgrades, which we could go on a great length about those. And the balance of $1.8 million will be allocated to utility infrastructure reserve, which will reduce, again, our future borrowing needs for the impending water treatment plant upgrades. So, again, really good news on many fronts. The explanation of why we are uh, over budget or under budget is in Appendix A, and I'm very happy... Uh, uh, to move at the recommendation of your committee that the Council of City of Portage Prairie approve the pre-audited 2020 financial statements. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Esty. Any questions or comments on the motion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion. And that's carried. The next item of new business is a variation extension and this is for PC-20. Uh, 17-21 for at 150 Tupper Street South. Thank you, Your Worship. From the Planning and Economic Development Kitty, uh, Committee, Council, your information or the report to Council's request for the extension for variation for 150 Tupper Street South or Lot 5, Block 2, Plan 1998. So the issue, of course, is to allow an extension of the original variation uh, for Cam and Lena Pahura. The original file number was PC1420, and this was to vary the side yard requirement, and that's when a corner lot of 3.6 meters to be reduced to 1.5 meters. The applicant would still like to remove the existing attached garage and construct a new one-car, two-story attached garage with living space above and behind the new garage. So you can see that this was originally approved back on March the 9th of 2020, and they're looking for an additional 12 months. The Planning Act Section 101 does state that a variance order will expire and cease to have any effect if it's not acted upon within 12 months of the date of the decision. A Board Council or Planning Commission may extend the deadline in the subsection for an additional period not longer than 12 months, but it's supposed to be received before the initial deadline. So the original order had expired on March the 9th, 2021. The variation order was to have been acted on or an extension asked before it expired. But as per Miss Municipal Relations Bulletin, number 2021-021.13, variance orders and conditional use orders have been granted a suspension uh, up until April the 30th, 2021. So that's to allow extra time to complete. So they're certainly in compliance. So as per the attached original variation order, you can see it there for your information. Administratively, there are no concerns with the application for an extension to the original variation order. And as such, they would recommend approval. So it's the recommendation, sorry, it's the recommendation of this committee and I so move that the Council of the City of Portage Prairie approve the request of Cam and Lena Pahura to extend the original variation order, which was originally PC 14-20 with the properties on 150 Tupper Street South, which are legally described as Lot 5, Block 2, Plan 1998 in the parish of Portage Prairie. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. Any questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Draycott? Thank you, Your Worship. Just for clarification, uh, I couldn't remember the living space above this garage being in the original, and, and I didn't see it uh, in the variation order that we have submitted here for our, our review. So just a clarification, is this a secondary suite or is this a living space for the existing house? Mr. Connell from the Planning District is going to enlighten us. The original one had the uh, suite above it. It's not a secondary suite. It's for themselves. And this one is the same thing. It'll be for uh, a suite for them, or a bedroom for themselves. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Seeing no further questions on the motion, all those in favor of the motion, and that's carried. Next item of new business is also variation extension. This is PC 18-21 for Zacharias at 701 Cedar Bay. Councilor Meyer. Thank you, Your Worship. Council, this is 
very similar to the previous request for the extension for variation. This one is file number PC18-21. For your information, the original order was there as well as the new. So the issue to allow an extension of the original variation uh, of Doug Zacharias, the original file number PC1220, to vary the side yard requirement on a corner lot of 3.6 meters to be reduced to 1.02 meters. The applicant would like to still construct a new 7.92 meter and by 8.53 meter garage. So the background, of course, the applicant had originally applied for a variation order back on March the 9th, 2020. It was approved. The resolution number is there for your information for an additional 12 months. The Planning Act does state a variance order will expire and cease to have any effect if it's not acted upon within 12 months of the date of the decision. The original decision on this expired March the 9th, 2021, but as per Municipal Relations Bulletin 2021-21.13, variation variance orders and conditional use orders have been granted a suspension until April the 30th, 2021 to allow for extra time to complete. So that does put this back into compliance. As per the original, attached original variation order in this matter, administratively, there have been no concerns with the application for the extension to the original variation order, and as such, they would recommend approval. With that said, as a recommendation of this committee, and I so move that the Council of the City of Porter's Prairie approve the request of Doug Zacharias to extend the original variation order, PC 1220, at the properties on 701 Cedar Bay, which is legally described as Lot 1, Block 3, Plan 1741 in the parish of Porter's Prairie. Moved by Councillor Meyer and seconded by Councillor Buds. Any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. The next item of new business is the Water Pollution Control Facility upgrade status, and this is for information. And um, Water Works Committee, Councillor Wall, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Tasks undertaken since early March regarding the Portage Hill Prairie Water Pollution Control Facility upgrading project include provided an updated cost estimate for the project with revised scope from the original application for funding in 2019 to Manitoba Strategic Initiatives and Alternate Delivery, formerly Manitoba Sustainable Infrastructure Secretariat. The ICIP agreement has not yet been received. The utility maintenance shop request for contractor qualifications was issued and the deadline for submissions was April 7th. The design build request for proposal documents continue to be developed and should be ready for issue on April 12th. That would be today. This will be substantially funded under the ICIP program. The project agreement and request for proposal documents continue to be developed project payment mechanism options, and industrial services agreement cost-sharing approaches are being considered. It's intended to issue the RFP once the wastewater loading and required treatment is confirmed and the funding is confirmed, which should be in late April. Discussions regarding industrial wastewater treatment requirements continued. A project update was provided to Manitoba Conservation and Climate and several issues with respect to the project schedule and environmental approvals were discussed. AECOM completed a basic odor dispersion computer model to enable criteria to be set for maximum odor limits at the site, adjacent to the site, and in nearby residential areas of the city. Tasks over the next month will include reviewing and proposing amendments to the ICIP funding agreement, if received, confirming the industrial wastewater loading and treatment requirement, finalizing the scope of work for the request for proposals and the project agreement shortlisting the proponents and issue the RFP for the design build of the utility maintenance building and compiling additional historic documents and wastewater characterization documents to be made available to the proponents. And that's that report. Thank you, Councilor Wall. Next item of new business is the award tender for supply of backhoe, and this is also Waterworks Committee. Councilor Wall. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this tender was advertised on the city website as well as Merck's. Seven companies picked up tenders and we received six bids from five companies. 
The tender closed March 23rd, 2021. This backhoe will be used to replace the older existing 2011 Volvo BL70 backhoe in the utility, utility equipment fleet. The Volvo will be included as a trade-in towards the purchase of the new backhoe. This unit will be used in the waterworks department for all day-to-day -day sewer and water repairs that occur during the year. The backhoe will also be used for snow clearing at the utility facilities, removing snow from fire hydrants, and for maintaining excavation sites. This hoe at times is used at the cemetery for digging plots. Toramount Cat had the highest rated sustain sustainability criteria tender price score at 95.5 points. Their bid met with all specifications asked for. The budgeted amount from approved capital for this purchase is 170,000. The recommendation is, and I so move, that the Council of the City of Port of Prairie award the tender for supply of a backhoe 21 OPS 008 to Toramount Cat for the tendered price of $153,545 net of GST and accept the trade-in price of $32,000 for the city's 2011 Volvo BL70 backhoe for a cost of $121,545 net of GST. Moved by Councillor Wall and seconded by Councillor Draycott. Uh, any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And the next item of new business is the award tender for supply of a sewer jet, and this is also a Waterworks Committee. Councillor Wall, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this tender was advertised as well on the city website as well as Merck's. Three companies were sent tenders and one bid was received. The tender closed March 23rd, 2021. This jet truck will be used to replace the 2011 International 4300 with Vactor Rem Jet V sewer jet. The international unit will be included as a trade-in towards the purchase of the new jet truck. The ramjet is an integral part of the waterworks daily operation. It's used to unblock plug sewer mains and regular maintenance of these mains and for soft digging traffic signs when necessary. The jet truck is also utilized to dig holes by hydrofacking into the ground, a soft dig, to locate sewer or water mains or other types of utilities like high pressure gas mains that require a watch person. The bid price on this unit came in at $328,760.59, including all taxes, also including the trade-in of the present unit owned by the city. The present unit was purchased in the fall of 2010 and received in 2011 at a cost of $159,252, including taxes and trade. This year's budget of $220,000 is close to 40% higher than the purchase of 2011. A market increase of more than 100% was not expected. The current models have incorporated more technological and user-friendly features that increase production. The 2021 budget for the jet truck replacement is 220,000, which leaves a shortfall of $92,230.24 net of GST the Public Works Division can utilize the follow, following available funds. The tender for the backhoe to be purchased from utility is $48,455 under budget. The water treatment plant upgrade, including the purchase of the raw water intake pump at $120,000. The Manitoba Water Services Board then issued a grant back to the city of 50% or $60,000 towards the purchase of the pump. Using the 48,455 left from the backhoe and using 43,775 from the $60,000 unused portion of the budgeted raw water intake pump amount would cover the purchase of the debt jet truck tender price. The recommendation is, and I so move, that the Council of the City of Portage La Prairie award the tender for the supply of a sewer jet. 21 OPS 009 to Joe Johnson Equipment 
for the tendered price of three hundred fifty three thousand dollars seven hundred and forty nine and forty nine cents net of GST and accept their trade in offer of forty one thousand five nineteen twenty five for the city's twenty eleven forty three hundred with a vector ramjet for a cost of three hundred twelve thousand two hundred thirty dollars and twenty four cents net of GST. Moved by Councillor Wall and seconded by Councillor Draycott. Any questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Knox? Um, my question is, is this that special of equipment that we only received one tender for it out of three? So do we know why we received just one tender? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Knox, it is a very specialized piece of equipment, as I mentioned in the, the bid that three went out. We only received one. We did follow up with the other companies and asked why they didn't bid. Uh, supply is an issue for this specialized piece of equipment. There's only so many units and some companies didn't want to also deal with the troublesome of doing with a trade-in, which is usually our policy. So we did receive one and uh, obviously substantially more than budget, which is a concern when you only have one person bidding on that project, uh, but we did bring you that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. The next item of business under uh, Waterworks Committee is the <coughs> award of a contract for supply and installation of two backup generators as specified in RFP number 21 OPS 007. The request for proposals was issued for the supply and installation of two backup power generators on February 12, 2021. This work includes installing a new 150 kilowatt diesel generator at the Broadway lift station and a new 200 kilowatt diesel generator at the 6th Avenue lift station. Bidders were asked to provide a price for the option of a natural gas supplied unit at the 6th Avenue location as well. The scope of work for both included supply of all equipment necessary for generators, concrete pad, and fencing. Seven companies submitted bids. Were they were evaluated based on qualifications and experience of the bidders, past relationships with the city, and sustainability factors. Technical criteria accounted for 70 points, and pricing accounted for the remaining 30 points. Some companies submitted multiple bids for different brands. And you'll see the uh, list of all the bidders and their their ratings and their prices. The last two companies were disqualified as they did not meet the minimum 50 points required in the evaluation to proceed with opening their bid price. The company that scored the most points was Point West, supplying Cummings brand. The Cummings brand is a higher cost than Kohler or Generac. However, the city already has Cummings installed at Poplar Bluff and two at the water treatment plant. Staff are very familiar with the operation and maintenance of this brand and have indicated they are easy to operate and have been proven reliable. By having the same equipment throughout the city allows for more efficient servicing and maintenance. The natural gas option was considered. However, due to significant increase in price, administration decided not to pursue this option and none of those costs were included in this report. The budget for this pro Project is $300,000. There's $150,000 allocated from reserve, and the remaining $150,000 was intended to come from a grant. The city was not successful in securing this grant, and the remaining $64,973.11 will be reallocated from the water treatment plant phase two project, which is projected to be completed under budget. The committee recommendation is, and I so move, that the Council of the City of Portage La Prairie award the contract for supply and installation of two backup generators to Point West Electric to install the Cummins brand diesel generators for a total contract price of $214,973.11 net of GST. Moved by Councillor Wall and seconded by Councillor Draycott. Any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And that's all I have this evening, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Wall. 
Uh, our last item of new business is an award tender for the supply of street sweeper. This is Transportation Committee. Councillor Esty, please. Thank you, Your Worship. This tender was advertised on the city website as well as Merck's. Eight companies were sent tender packages and we received three bids from three companies. The tender closed on March 23rd, 2021. This sweeper will replace the 2014 Global M3 unit owned by the city. The Global unit will be included as a trade-in towards the purchase of the new sweeper. This is the only unit in the city's fleet and due to the harsh conditions created by sweeping, the sweeper unit wears down quite rapidly and becomes very costly to maintain. The sweeper is used on city streets as required and is also rented out to a few larger companies for parking lot sweeping, which, turns, which in turn brings in some revenue. Two bid submissions met with all the specifications asked asked for while well, one bid submission was disqualified as it did not, did not meet the important specifications. A three-wheel chassis was specified, allowing to maneuver entire areas. Their submission had four wheels. Engine requirement was very different as they specified two motors, one to run the truck and another to run the sweeper. Transmission was not hydrostatic as required. Hopper was to be rear dump, but theirs was side dump, fuel tank smaller, and it was short on amber flashing lights. Joe Johnson had the highest rated sustainability criteria slash tender price score at 95 points. Their price of $221,522.54 net of GST and including the trade-in of the city's global sweeper is $8,477.46 under the allotted budget of $230,000. It is the administrative recommendation that the Council of the City of Portage of Prairie award the tender for the supply of a street sweeper as specified in tender 21 OPS 010 to jo Joe Johnson Equipment for the tender price of $241,522.54 net of GST and accept their trade-in offer of $20,000 for the City's 2014 M3 sweeper for a cost of $221,522.54 net of GST. And I so move. Moved by Councillor Espy and seconded by Councillor Meyer. Any questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. We have no old business this evening. So council is adjourned at 6.58 p.m. and we're gonna move right into committee. Gonna move right into committee. No one else. Usually it's me giving all the IT assistance. Oh, thank you. Okay, perfect. We'll call committee to order at 7 p.m. First up is Finance Legislative Committee. Councillor Buds, please. Thank you, Worship. Your committee has nothing to report. Thank you. City Planning and Economic Development Committee. Councillor Meyer, please. Thank you, Worship. The City Planning and Economic Development Committee has nothing to report. Community Service Committee, Councillor Draycott, please. Thank you, Worship. We do have a couple of items actually this evening for Community Services Committee. One item going to mm -hmm. next council meeting, and it is to provide some information on the city's involvement in green space initiatives and to foster support for the national 2022 year of the garden. So just some analysis on that quickly, if there's any conversation that wants to be had at this moment. Uh, spring is fast approaching, though it doesn't seem like it today. And administration is providing some information on various green space initiatives and related celebratory events that are going to occur in the city of Portage La Prairie in the coming year. 
So outlined there are the Manitoba 150 celebrations that uh, should have been held last year in 2020, uh, but they were paused in early 2020 and deferred to 2021 due to the pandemic. So the city was awarded a grant of $20,000 funding for this initiative. And we have purchased banners for Saskatchewan Avenue downtown area. Other funding will be used to place large MB 150 themed floral displays on the island at the windmill and for benches and planters downtown sidewalks planned to be rebuilt this year. So uh, just following the MB 150 floral color theme of red, yellow, white, and blue for our public planters and hanging baskets this year as well as some information there about communities in bloom we generally participate in this program and have for several years and we did achieve a rating of four out of five blooms in 2019 however 2020 the program was cancelled due to the pandemic as well and programming is resurfacing this year in 2021 and the city will be participating again so in addition the communities in bloom committee is taking on a project to enhance the cenotaph site the water sidewalks at the site will provide better accessibility for mobility challenged persons and the gardening portage division of this committee will continue to assist in new planting at the island duck pond redevelopment project with our local rotary club which began in 2020 and is looking great so far uh, nationally the communities in bloom organization is promoting gardens of hope for the summer of 2021 so residents who might be interested in participating in that initiative can find some further details at www.hopeisgrowing.ca and we hope to see some more hope in the community involved in the communities in bloom program coming up this year and Thirdly, the National Year of the Garden. So the Canadian Garden Council is requesting that cities, towns, and interested organizations provide letters of support to the federal government through their local elected officials to declare 2022 the Year of the Garden throughout Canada. This is seen as a further initiative to support our, our country emerging from the pandemic and to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Canada's horticulture sector. So further information is available at that website provided as well. And just in general, gardening has increased in popularity as many search for ways to improve their quality of life with the pandemic safety measures. And for our city, encouraging green space beautification is beneficial to our residents and to tourism as well. So there is a recommendation that will be coming uh, to support the 2020 year of the garden and to issue a letter of support for that initiative at our next council meeting. It's a lot of information. I don't know if there's any questions about any of that that are relatable right now. Well, just a comment that gardening is the fastest growing recreation activity in North America today. So it reflects that. It definitely makes for healthier households, both physically and uh, through nutrition. So it's very much recommended. I'm very much looking forward to some of the initiatives coming down the pipeline. And as well, I was hoping to have some feedback from our youth councillor. Welcome to our council meeting again today. Uh, if you're able to take the podium, I was wondering if you could share some of the things that you have going on. I understand that you are the new Indigenous Community Coordinator Assistant with the PCRC, if you'd be able to outline what's going on there, as well as uh, what you have going on with the Urban Indigenous Fresh Food and Cleaning Supply Hampers. Hello, um, so yeah, I just got a position at PCRC as the Indigenous Community Coordinator Assistant. So basically what that is, um, I'm working for Cornell Paget as his assistant, um, but I do, I do help out with uh, all his coalition meetings. We actually have one coming up on the 15th, I believe, yeah. And um, I, what I do, what I'm doing is I help him set, a, set it up and I record the minutes and take notes and uh, right now I'm running two social media pages for the coalition so I have an Instagram and a Facebook page and right now at PCRC we're working on a project um, called the Urban Indigenous Fresh Food slash Cleaning Supply Hampers and what that is is PCRC and co-op have come together and we've basically got hampers and we are giving them out to indigenous families 
um, resided in Portage La Prairie. And um, if you want to read, if anyone wants to register, they can call me at 204-240-8528 or else um, we do have registration forms online. I believe they have it on the PCRC page as long as the um, Portage Urban Indigenous Peoples Coalition page. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to share today. Wonderful, thanks so much for your involvement in that project and for the update on it. Thank you, Councillor Hu. And that is all I have for committee this evening, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Draycott. And Councillor Wall, Waterworks Committee. Your Waterworks Committee has no report this evening, Your Worship. And Councillor Espy, uh, Transportation Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. The Transportation Committee has nothing to report. Councillor Knox, House Public Safety. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. We have a couple of things this evening. First of all, we're coming up to one year of our implementation of our parking strategy. So the Public Safety Committee thought it would be a good idea to give an update uh, from administration on the strategy. So in 2020, City Council announced the implementation of a new multi-phase downtown parking strategy. The goals were to eliminate parking meters, to implement free time monitored parking for customers, establish fee-based parking options for long-term parking, and implement electronic marketing monitoring of parking to reduce enforcement costs. So phase one began in May of 2020 when we removed the parking meters and replaced them with two free two-hour street parking. Phase two was scheduled to begin on October 1st with the introduction of time-limited lot parking, but during the implementation process, Stakeholders were asked to provide feedback and City Council received a su substantial public response related to phase two of the parking strategy. To allow us time to review and consider the feedback, this was postponed to November 1st, 2020. In November, the parking strategy came into full effect. A communica communication campaign was released notifying residents of the changes with methods including local specific flyers, video, social media, website, radio, and with our media partners. The Auto Chalk Parking Enforcement System provided mailed out warnings to users for several weeks before formally issuing tickets, providing an opportunity for users to become aware of the new parking strategy. In the five months since implementing the new system, many of the primary goals of the strategy have been achieved. Residents have provided feedback that the removal of the parking meters and the two hour time limit have made it much easier for them to support local merchants without worrying about change or tickets. The auto chalk vehicle has been successful in enforcing the time limited parking on the formerly metered streets and surface based parking lots. Additionally, the technology has allowed the city to reduce the cost of the bylaw service contract and provide more resources to enforce derelict properties rules and rules regarding street-based parking in residential neighborhoods. Surface parking lot revenue was better than anticipated in 2020, bringing in just under $25,000, largely due to the popularity of the annual parking pass option. In 2020, the city collected approximately $25,000 in ticket revenue, and so far has received $6,000 at the end of March 2021. These, ta these targets are in line with the original business cases. However, <laughs> despite the overall success of the parking strategy, there are remaining challenges that administration will need to overcome in 2021. While the last five months of enforcement have been successful, traffic flow is believed to be low in the downtown corridor due to the impacts of COVID-19. If larger vehicle traffic volumes return later in 2021, we will have to monitor the effectiveness of our enforcement on street-based parking and possible congestion on surface parking lots. An additional concern is the public understanding of the time-limited parking restrictions for street-based and surface parking lots. The bylaw states that once someone has parked in block face, they must not return to that area for a four-hour period. This is to prevent someone simply moving their car around a parking lot or advancing their vehicle minimally down the block to avoid moving their car. 
This bylaw provision was replicated from other municipalities who use the auto chalk system to prevent abuse of street-based and surface-based parking restrictions. This restriction will not impact the vast majority of vehicle parking. However, we do have residents that may be caught by the system parked in the same block face twice within this time period, even if they have left the block face during the two hour period. This has caused frustration for some who are issued tickets in this situation and have voiced their concerns that they feel the rule is unfair or not effectively communicated. While our initial communication campaign did stress this parking restriction rule, this information needs to be shared in a continuous information campaign, especially as restrictions related to COVID-19 begin to lift. Administration will continue with downtown stakeholders and residents to effectively communicate parking rules for the downtown corridor and monitor the results of the new parking strategy. Council will receive another report regarding the parking strategy in November of 2021, the one year anniversary of the implementation of phase two. That's the information on the parking strategy and I found it interesting that administration definitely pointed out the comments and concerns that I've heard from citizens on the parking. It seems that it, it is people who get tickets with the block face part of it and I think we just all have to continually help educate people on that information because it, it is a little confusing for sure. That's it on parking but I just did want to take this time to um, give a little shout out for something that happened in our community last week with our um, neighboring neighboring community that Long Plain held a vaccine clinic and due to excess vaccines that they had, Chief Meaches and their health director, Melanie Pritchard, made a decision to, rather than let the vaccines go to waste, that they invited our first responders out to be vaccinated. And I, for one, want to thank them for that decision because um, protecting the people who protect us is important to me. So. Thank you, Chief Meaches and all of those at Long Plain for inviting us out there. That so ends my report. Okay, thank you for acknowledging uh, Long Plains being a great neighbor of ours. Um, I'd spoken to Chief Meaches after that happened last week and, and um, you know, there was a little bit of negative press. Um, and he said to me, he said, you know what? We interact with people from Portage and Prairie all the time. It was the right thing to do, and uh, he stands by his decision. So we certainly appreciate having good neighbors like that. Sure do. Seeing there's no further business, committee is adjourned at 7.14 p.m. Thank you for coming out, everybody.